very warm welcome and greetings from gorgeous Glasgow, which has been beautifully sunny all week. Um, we're very excited um, to be present here for COP26 and to represent the consumer voice. Um, this is sometimes uh, less heard on the global stage, but is so important because after all, three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions are from lifestyle consumption. That's including mobility, diet, housing, and we'll need to reduce those very significantly. So by 80% in developed countries, by anywhere between 20 to 80% in developing countries, depending on the scenarios. But it's rare that you have conversations uh, pragmatically about how to make that happen. These can become very value laden. Um, these can be, become very polarized between is it the, the responsibility of individuals? Is it the responsibility of the marketplace? And of course, it's all of the above, but we need to go beyond that to the pragmatic solutions. So what's exciting today is to actually hear from people who are thinking about the rights and responsibilities of consumers every day. They are consumer advocates. As you can see on the map in front of you now, they are actually everywhere in the world. Every country has a consumer advocacy voice, a consumer advocacy organization that is thinking about quality, price, safety, choice, redress, but also fairness, also sustainability, that those are available to everybody. And here today, we have consumer advocates from around the world who will be thinking about um, and sharing with us their views on how we make that greenhouse gas emission and the, the targets and the promises and the pledges, how we actually make it a reality. If we can move to the next slide. For COP26, we took the opportunity to bring together the views of our members around the world. We have 200 consumer advocacy members of Consumers International and summarized their views. We covered six areas, how we travel, how we plug in, what we buy, what we eat, how we live, and how we spend and save. These are the key areas that as consumer advocates, um, we know need to change and we have pr pragmatic solutions and recommendations around. On the next slide, you will see what those recommendations are at a very high level. And in the chat, for those of you who are able to access that, we are putting a link to the report which provides much more detail around these recommendations and the rationale for them. We're going to hear from each of the speakers uh, later in the panel about these in more detail, so I won't go into, into uh, further depth right now, but you can see across these, it is really about increasing consumer awareness, making sure that we uh, address affordability, thinking about accessibility to sustainable products uh, and services, and really about action and innovation. We are hugely optimistic um, about the future, a sustainable consumption and production future, but we are also, we recognize that changes need to be made in a fast, a fair, and an accountable way. If we go to the next slide, please, you can see that the core recommendations are threefold. First, this needs to be fast. Um, saving now will make a much greater difference than saving later. Um, the challenge we face is exponential and we must start, we must make this fast, especially as 50% of consumer advocates in our network still say that consumers are unaware of the changes in consumption required for the world to reach net zero. But it must be fair. The combined emissions of the richest 1% account for more than the poorest 50% of consumers. And that 1% will need to make changes uh, in their footprint of over a factor of 30. So we are recommending a consumer fairness test for every climate mitigation policy so that this works for all. And finally, accountability. Nine out of 10 consumer 
organizations are actively working to help consumers live lower carbon lifestyles. And yet it is rare that consumer advocates have a um, strong and continued uh, engagement into policymaking when this could accelerate the change so much faster. So we ask for an expansion and deepening of consumer representation and participation. So the report that you can see in the chat has both sector specific recommendations, but these three overarching calls for action for a consumer powered transition. We're looking forward to sharing more of that and hearing reactions from our consumer advocates around the world to the report in just a, a moment. But first, um, I believe we are going to hear uh, and see a rapid video where we hear directly from other consumer advocates around the world. Kitty? who are 200 consumer advocacy groups in 100 countries around the world. We are calling on governments to commit to a fast, a fair and an accountable transition. One that unlocks the power of us all as consumers in the marketplace to drive change. Listening to people and understanding their experience as consumers in the marketplace is essential for making sure that commitments at COP26 become a reality. Our latest consumer survey says, consumers will be able to do more to build a zero carbon world if they are empowered with more information and choices and if the city has the right infrastructure to support their action. It's crucial and urgent that the change to a lower carbon lifestyle and the changes must go fast. But the transition must be fair and consumer friendly. Consumers play a vital role in the transition. The way we live, heat our homes, the way we move, the way we eat, how much and what kind of consumer goods do we buy? These all make a difference. Consumers are key for the path towards a zero carbon economy. We need their support and we need their power because together consumers can steer markets and become even a driver for lower emissions. Consumers with the power that we have, we can decide what buy or what we buy. Our consumer research has shown that most people in the UK understand the need for urgent action to tackle climate change. However, they need better information and more support to make the changes necessary. In Denmark, we have a national target of reducing our carbon impact with 70% in 2030. We urge our government to take this target into the COP26, not only as a target, but also with true actions and measurements of the process. Our government should commit to replace carbon emitted vehicles with uh, e-vehicles and also to improve the public transport facilities to the consumers. Coming up, our government plans to regulate one of disposable plastics by 2023, and we hope it could be accelerated. We want real political actions for more sustainable energy, housing, mobility, food, services and finances. We want you to commit to longer lasting products, more circularity and, sh and sharing economy and better consumer rights. We hope that the Indonesian government at GUP26 will fight for how to reduce carbon emission into a real commitment with serious implementation in each country. If the UK is going to meet its commitment to be net zero by 2050, people and their consumption choices will have to be put at the heart of action to tackle climate change. But if we want consumers to use this green consumer power, they need to have a real choice. That's why we need our governments to make sure everyone has access to easy, convenient and affordable green alternatives. We aim to inform consumers about the 
current source of their energy and the alternative they can choose to protect their health and the environment. Consumer Council of Zimbabwe, we advocate for the use of public transport to lessen carbon emissions. A project uh, together with a consortium led by the University of Salonico called the Mile21.eu, which enabled more than 10,000 people so far to reduce their fuel emissions, uh, actually having control over their fuel consumptions. Yeah, the Consumer Council of Fiji is also doing its part by promoting sustainable consumption and production among consumers. As collective action is required to protect the environment, which can only be achieved if there is widespread individual awareness on the cancerous effect carbon is having on the environment. Fantastic. What a pleasure to hear from around the world. So let's start the conversation. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, both consumer advocates, but also government representation um, so that we can hear about how we can work better together. Um, I'm going to ask each of our consumer advocates in turn to talk about a particular area, but also their overarching view um, and a little bit about what they've been doing in this space and they're thinking about uh, their strategy. A, the vast majority of consumer advocates around the world are focused on sustainable consumption uh, within their strategy. So you can hear, see here today, uh, we have Luisa Crisid Giovanni from Italy and Ultra Consumer, uh, Rothio Concha, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Which in the UK, uh, Vinash Singh, who is one of our Consumers International Next Generation Leaders from Fiji, Maite Cortez, who is a director at Colectivo Ecologista Jalisco in Mexico, Seema Shandil, who is a C the CEO at the Consumer Council of Fiji, and Saroja Sundaram, executive director, Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group in Chennai, India. A warm welcome to you all. And I would like to welcome our special guest, in addition, of course, um, who is the ambassador of Fiji to the United Nations. If we could flick to the next slide, we'd be able to see uh, him. And uh, Dr. Satyendra Prasad is representing a nation which uh, has 1% of global greenhouse emissions, but where since 1993 uh, has seen a sea rise of six millimeters per year. Um, and in reaction to that um, and in leadership um, set their uh, net zero targets. I think they're among only seven countries in the world that have set a commitment legally to a net zero target by 2050. Um, and I think it will be fascinating to hear from him how he works with consumer advocacy in that country uh, to make change. So let's start the conversation. And remember, if you're listening in, we welcome questions. I see Luisa is already responding uh, there, which is fantastic. I encourage all our speakers to do so. Luisa, I am going to come to you first um, to talk about how we travel. Um, let's face it, this is uh, probably one of the areas that um, it has some of the greatest uh, impact, but sometimes some of the least action. I think it's something like I saw a recent study that only about 1% of policies actually focus on aviation specifically. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you see as the key changes that can be made. What would you like to see policymakers shift to help consumers make a behavioral change? What have you been doing on this front? Over to you, Luisa. Thank you, Elena, and uh, hello to everyone. It's been uh, a great pleasure to be part of, of uh, Consumers International Family and provide you um, some insight uh, of the role that uh, a consumer organization such as Altro Consumo can play. Uh, as, as you have seen in the video, we can actually uh, gather consumers already in Italy, uh, but all over the world. So thanks to the platform, the web platform, 
we can actually um, have the consumer insight and engagement in order to enable the change. How? In this case, the, the, the example I quoted in, in the video is the example of Mile 21 uh, project uh, uh, offering actually two tools, one to measure emissions of uh, your car and one to select greener cars, okay? And you get the advice once you um, provide information related to three rethinks. Uh, and so is active contribution of uh, user content contribution to really uh, match the database which already collects, uh, for example, the data coming from uh, the car manufacturers. Because one of the big issue, which is uh, something that uh, we want to address uh, uh, in terms of message to the government's uh, uh, representative is that we need to monitor the progress. And one of the gaps that we experienced, uh, at least in Europe, was the fact that there was this huge gap between what was declared to be a green car hmm, and what was in reality was the pollution of that car. And according to the study that we, we made together with the partners of Mile 21 project, that there was this gap of 40%. And according to this running tool, you can really detect, detect how much your, your car pollutes. And of course, uh, the most interesting uh, thing is this can be part of the life cycle assessment of car manufacturers themselves. And coming back also, to your previous question, another point of attention for the government uh, and uh, for even uh, more generally speaking, the institution bearing a responsibility in relation to, um, you know, enabling uh, through infrastructure, uh, a kind of change towards uh, um, no fossil fuel um, transport. We need infrastructures as a, a charging points because it's simple to say, okay, consumers should choose an electric car. But the point is, uh, what's about the infrastructure to recharge that car? Uh, what's about the interoperability issue uh, of the way uh, we, we are paying that, that uh, charge? And of course, coming back to the Mile 21 platform again, here we, uh, for example, offer the possibility uh, to compare among different models of car, also because we know that according to the study about the total cost of ownership, so not only the, the, the cost of um, buying a new electric car, which is less polluting, okay, according to the study than the fossil ones, the point is not just recharging it, but considering, uh, let's say, um, as an alternative, the possibility to develop uh, both uh, second-hand markets and also possibility of using where it exists uh, public transport or developing, for example, lines uh, for using the bicycle, uh, because if the lines are not safe, uh, you can use an alternative means. So in the end, in a nutshell, the conclusion is that consumers' organizations are there to create uh, collective purchases, if you want, of, of people in relation even to uh, second-hand, uh, uh, maybe hybrid uh, electric cars market to uh, provide advice directly to consumers on how to uh, maybe which which are the alternatives in terms of uh, you know moving uh, forwards uh, and, and reaching a point uh, and provide this kind of intelligence or, or through the study and the survey and and the feedback that we collect from from consumer directly. But the point is that when infrastructures are needed, and take, for example, my, com my country right now, uh, we have uh, 200 billion euro that we got from, from Europe also to, to go greener for, for the transition. We want this to, to be well invested in the right infrastructure. So it's not just a question of giving incentive to get the greener car, but it's also uh, to refer uh, to the evaluation made by consumer groups such as Altro Consumer in Italy, uh, which really analyze the market and has the intelligence uh, to, to really enable 
the choice of people you know that this to be you know um, the right one because maybe depending on where you live you don't even even need a car because maybe you have alternatives so we need to encourage really the best possible and sustainable choice uh, because we we produce a footprint as you mentioned before uh, the 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 sectors where we um, spend uh, in terms of household, households uh, the most uh, are the sectors which are a real uh, important footprint. And so uh, these are food and transport and, of course, uh, uh, heating our houses. So we need to um, not to make uh, uh, people feel guilty, but on the contrary, play a role uh, to help them uh, make this choice, uh, not only in this case saying, okay, um, what to buy, but really uh, making the real bridge uh, towards the producer and towards the government to, to make it happen, as you mentioned before. Thank you very much, Luisa. And I love the way you were talking about sort of making sure that it's easy, that consumers have information from the project you talked about, which was across multiple countries in Europe. Um, so that consumers are better informed about uh, electric vehicles and electric transport, but then also lobbying government to provide that infrastructure, sort of touching two and three of the recommendations that we have in the report. If I can come now, I know also in Mexico, um, uh, work is being fantastic work is being done actually on urban infrastructure, but I'm going to ask you Maite, to talk a bit about another area, which is how we plug in and energy. Now, in the work we've done, um, we heard that 60% um, of our members say that consumers in their country are very unaware of the fuel mixes in their electricity tariffs. Um, so there's a, a lack of awareness, which I know that you're, you're thinking and, and, and working on. Tell us the approach that you're taking. What should be done to help consumers make the energy transition? And what are you doing in Mexico? Maite. Thank you, Helena. And I'm very happy to join this morning. We've been working for over 35 years on sustainable consumption and production. And right now, um, in this context, we are, um, because of what our federal government is moving towards, I'm going to explain to you a bit later. Mostly, we are uh, trying to work with uh, consumers to make them aware of the source of the energy they use on a daily basis. Um, for us, it's very important that we, in, in all parts of the world, that we get to know where the energy we use daily is coming from. And we live in Guadalajara, which is one of the, fair, the three most important cities in Mexico, where around 5 million people. And it seems like a, a big bunch of the energy we're consuming comes from a thermoelectric plant in the neighbor state of Colima. Uh, that is currently burning heavy fuel oil. And that is not only around here, but th that's like, like the public policy our government is pushing. Um, so for us, it's very important. Um, and I will say that like in the steps, the first step is that the consumers have or get to know the source of their energy and they do research and find out whether it's clean or dirty energy also get and have more technical knowledge because as you're aware, energy is a very abstract issue and it's very hard sometimes to grab what's really about and what implies. On the other hand, also to connect what they experience like floods and landslides. Now that you're talking, for instance, about Fiji where they have the direct impact and the experience of what does climate change mean uh, so that people can make this connection between their daily habits, energy habits, what they plug in and what does that mean to other experiences related to climate change, like floods and, and landslides. Because sometimes or usually people are not aware and they don't make that connection. So it's like two different things, including the price of the energy bill, because we have to see, to look at the externalities, not only in terms of what's social, but environmental and also the cost of the bill in our pockets. And for us, it's very important to make change meaningful for consumers, make change meaningful for people, not only as an abstract idea, we have to make changes, but rather to understand in very concrete ways 
how to manage that and how to do that. And also to look at the impact, social impacts of the production of the energy in several countries, because for instance, the deposition of the emissions we are producing are harming fisheries, are harming farmers, are harming many other uh, communities, not only in the urban areas, and not only as a general uh, problem with climate change. Right now in Mexico, we're really concerned and, and we would like our friends and allies of Consumers International all over the world to look at Mexico because our federal government is trying to, to pass a constitutional amendment that might, um, that will threaten and maybe cancel our ch changes, I mean, sorry, our chances to have energy efficiency renewable and electricity and self-generated renewable energy. So all of these issues um, are very hard for us because Mexico used to lead the, the way in, you know, like from, from countries from the South on the climate change, um, public policies and commitments and so on. And right now our federal government is really moving backwards. For us, that's a huge uh, problem and a huge issue. And we're very happy to, to have the chance to share these ideas with you, and I hope they are useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, let's move to how we buy and what we buy. Now, Rocio, if I can come to you, um, when we asked our members, 50% uh, of them said that consumer understanding of the, the footprint, the carbon footprint of the things they buy, uh, consumer understanding of that is low or very low. How do we improve on that? What are the key steps we can take about the what we buy, the manufactured, manufactured goods that are produced from a consumer standpoint? Yes, thank you, Helena. And thank you also for the invitation. I think that's, um, it's brilliant really to be here and discuss these issues with other consumer groups. So yes, I mean, the products that we buy, how we use them and how we dispose them is a fundamental issue for us to meet our, uh, to reduce carbon emissions uh, by households. Um, and our research shows that there are two main barriers. The main, one barrier is cost. There is a perception that sustainable products are too expensive. And the second barrier is access to trustworthy information. So consumers don't know where to find the information. And also they don't know when there are some um, claims about products being sustainable, they don't know whether they can believe those claims. So we ask consumers what changes they would like to see. Um, nine in 10 want clear information about durability and also a much clear energy labeling. A in 10, we like to know more about the reparability of those products. So in the UK, there has been some progress in relation to those areas, to tackle those areas. Now, we think that we need to do far more given the scale of the challenge. And I want to give you uh, some examples. So we have uh, new eco-design regulations. Those regulations apply to uh, uh, certain products. And the purpose of the regulation is to set minimum energy performance standards and introduce the right to repair uh, measures, which basically require the manufacturers to make uh, spare uh, parts available to repair some of these products. So that is a step in the right direction, but we want to have more products to be covered in, the, in these regulations. And also we want technology products to be included in this, like for example, smartphones. Also we think that as a part of that, we need to have longer guarantees. If these products are going to last longer, we need to make sure that there are guarantees for that products that also adapt to the fact that these products are going to, are we are going to be uh, lasting longer. And we want to see minimum um, security uh, software standard for the smart products as well, because that is part of making these products also safe and to, uh, to last longer. Also, there is uh, there have been progress on energy labels. I mean, we have energy labels since 1994, uh, but recently these energy labels have been uh, simplified for some products. 
but not only simpl it simplifies to help consumers to engage with their labels and understand what their labels uh, mean, but also these have been including more modern um, efficiency standards. Now that labels uh, include certain products, we think that needs to be included more products as a part of that label, but also that the government should explore um, how to make information about the durability, reparability, and the recyclability of those products uh, available uh, for consumers. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what we are doing. So obviously we, we see ourselves as a consumer organization playing a very important role uh, in helping consumers across all the areas of sustainability. So we have increased uh, a lot of our advice in relation to sustainability in uh, helping consumers to make sustainable choices in everyday life. Um, we want to make sure that we are there to give them rigorous and objective information about sustainability. And as a part of that, we launched uh, the Which Eco Buy label uh, this year, which basically is to give information to consumers about you know, products that meet certain sustainability criteria. And the plan is that we want to extend that label uh, to 30 products uh, by, um, by the end of July. Now, in addition to that, Obviously, we think that we have an important role to play in working with businesses and government to make sure that when we, they are thinking about this issue, and it's related to something that you were seeing before, consumers are really understood. The barriers that consumers are facing are really understood, so that can be tackled across the whole area. It's not only about subsidies. Obviously, helping them um, in, in terms of costs in particular areas is very important, but it's more than that. There are other barriers, like, for example, the ones on, on, on information. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope the audience and those of you who aren't steeped in consumer advocacy are appreciating the variety of intervention points that are possible here um, and the uh, complexity and variety of um, how uh, the solutions need to need to unfold. But let's move to food. Now, food is responsible for about 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we were present at the United Nations Food System Summit, a very complex issue, which then sometimes doesn't get connected into the climate discussion. So we're hoping to see more of a, a breaking down of silos between the food discussions and the climate discussions here. I'm going to turn to Vinash, um, who is in Fiji. I'm going to um, basically introduce him as one of our amazing uh, cohort of next generation leaders in consumer advocacy. Vinash, what do you think should be done on uh, food? How can we help consumers with what they eat? Uh, thank you, Director General. Uh, first of all, heads off to the entire Consumers International team uh, for creating this crucial platform, uh, which actually brings people together to stir conversation and which would later hopefully translate into concrete action as well. So as a member of the Consumers International uh, Young Leaders Generation, and as a passionate consumer advocate of a small island developing state, I'm actually delighted to briefly discuss one of the key aspects of a consumer-centered climate transition, that is food, and as well as to provide a snapshot of some of the work which we have been doing here in Fiji in this area in order to help consumers actually uh, to take action in order to transform their consumption patterns and contribute to a net zero world. Uh, just to provide some context, uh, each of us has an effect on the environment, and it's often in ways we don't think about. Uh, take food, for example. There has been numerous studies and reports uh, uh, which has been uh, done, which indicates that food accounts for uh, from 10% uh, to up to maybe 30, 40% of a house, household's carbon footprint, which is the total amount of green, uh, greenhouse gases emissions we cause directly and indirectly. Which, which has actually astounding effect on climate change itself. So food uh, is, is it is a very actually crucial component we actually need to talk about as well. So food takes water to produce as well. And when we waste food, we are wasting all the water, energy, and other resources that went into producing it. And then there's packaging as well. So much packaging which we are using in in food processing and package uh, in uh, retailing as well. So the most immediate action any one of us as consumers can take on climate change 
today is to look at what we are putting onto our plates and what we are putting into our bodies as well. So, but on, on, a, on a light note as well, so it can be also powering to realize that we as consumers, we can actually help mitigate huge environmental problems through our food choices. But knowing what to eat and what to cut back on, it, it's, it's actually not an easy thing to talk about. It's not an easy thing to actually do as well. So because there are many steps which actually involved, uh, which actually occurs between the farm and actually when the food actually reaches our table as well. Uh, I will actually briefly detail some of the work which we have done towards this, uh, towards the end of my uh, intervention here. So I think all of us uh, on this particular platform would agree that the issues such as unsustainable consumption and production in the context of food, uh, of course, it is a serious threat. It is a serious threat to our global, uh, to our health as well. So it has increasing been, uh, increasing been recognized by everyone, uh, researchers, scientists, even policymakers as well. The consumer behavior, actually, that is one of the main factors. It, it actually what we eat, how and how much people consume directly impacts the environment. So a shift towards sustainable consumer uh, or consumerism or sustainable behavior it is actually needed to satisfy the present needs while simultaneously benefiting or limiting the environmental impacts. So consumption therefore is inherently linked to sustainability because every decision of what to buy, how much to buy, how much to consume and how to dispose has a direct impact on the environment and ultimately on our future generations and the future of our planet as well. Uh, given the time constraint, I will just quickly highlight some of the work we uh, at the Consumer Council of Fiji, we have been doing to help consumers in Fiji to make more environmentally conscious decisions in regards to the consumption or specifically food choices. Uh, as the Director General has mentioned that uh, Fiji is actually, you know, one of the least contributors uh, towards uh, global uh, carbon emissions. However, you know, as a small country, we end up facing the brunt of the impact. So I think, you know, uh, and re in spite of that, we are still doing you know, uh, a lot of work uh, in Fiji in order to help, you know, attend consumers towards uh, sustainable consumption, uh, excuse me, and production as well. So just sharing some of, you know, quick examples of work which we have done uh, uh, from last year, just recently uh, in this particular area. So in 2020, uh, through the Consumers International Green Action Fund, uh, we actually conducted a project whereby we directly engaged with the consumers at the community level, whereby we brought different villages together to share ways in which they can transform their consumption and production methods uh, towards sustainability. And one of the impact of this was actually different villages and uh, people coming together and helping each other in manual cultivation of their lands uh, instead of using machinery. So this was actually an effort to signify uh, the reduction or how they can actually tackle uh, carbon emissions and promote sharing community as well. Uh, meanwhile, this year currently uh, through again the Consumers International Green Action Fund, uh, we are also helping communities in Fiji realize that how their food choices or consumption patterns, uh, it actually determines uh, the future of our children and, uh, and those after that as well. Uh, with a specific focus on deforestation, which, we, which people do in order to grow food currently. So we have uh, uh, one of the you know, major impacts which we are currently realizing through this you know, short project which we are doing is uh, we have actually successfully planted you know, thousands of trees in the selected villages as well, just to signify uh, you know, the importance of sustainability uh, to consumers. So we are also working at the policy level as well with the Fijian government in order to ensure that consumers are coded with information and other tools as well when they are actually making their purchasing decisions, uh, which is a key pillar to transforming our food systems. So just lastly, on a larger scale, more awareness, collective action, and consumer pressure on producers and larger companies, government action and emerging technologies can actually reverse some of the negative trends of the food system which has been sent. So which has to be achieved by working together and, and ensuring that no one is left behind. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Vinash. In interests of time, and I realize so many different conversations are opening up here and we hope this is an invitation to others to continue them with us. Um, I'm going to go to Saroja to talk to us a little bit about um, ways in which we support consumers 
in uh, how we live or more precisely how we heat and cool our homes. Now, the, the energy impact is obviously in the way we build our homes and when we use them. And the thing that always strikes me is right now there are 1.6 billion air conditioners in use uh, residentially. Um, that is likely to grow to 5.6 billion by 2050, with meaning that the energy demand just from air conditioning, especially in cities, will triple to the equivalent of 25% of power use right now. I mean, that, that's an extraordinary, so the importance of this particular piece cannot be understated. So Roja, could we come to you and, and could you share a little bit about the recommendations for how we heat and cool our homes from your perspective? Yeah, thank you, Helena. So I, actually, I would like to first talk about uh, cooling technologies and then move to the heating part. Since I come from India, uh, I would like to focus first on the home cooling technologies. So actually, uh, I think we need to address this from, from two uh, aspects. The first one, which we need to focus on, in very important one is to actually encourage urban areas to be designed with natural cooling. So urban, urban greening for cooling cities is very important because if we'll see in the last two decades, extreme temperature events have increased in frequency and severity around the world. The number of people exposed to heat waves has increased by approximately 125 million across the globe. And in India, it is estimated that 39% of the global workers lost due to acute heat uh, I, I, uh, is amounting to around 118 billion hours. In this situation, I think it is very important that we talk about this. Raise awareness about nature-based solutions first. So how we design our homes and what are the, uh, the, uh, the setback spaces that we need to actually uh, allow the, uh, the material that we use for building our houses and um, to actually integrate nature-based solution uh, in our policies to have a policy framework that integrates this. Uh, nature-based solution, all these are very important. And also to have a green roof, it's, it's, it helps to actually reduce stormwater runoff, improve air quality, helps to mitigate urban heat island effect. So, uh, and I think uh, worldwide, this is actually um, uh, green roof legislations are being promoted. And so this is something we need to focus on and uh, consider uh, promote green certification uh, and all. And also very important to actually uh, consider community stewardship. Community participation is key to building long-term long, long -term resilience. I think we need to focus on that actually, uh, uh, like to combine uh, data science, participatory citizen uh, science approach uh, to bring in the local government and resident welfare associations, everyone to work together to make sure that the flora and fauna, uh, water bodies in the area are not um, uh, disturbed and there is no unplanned development which leads to uh, increase in uh, temperatures. So having said this, uh, as Helena had mentioned, uh, like there is uh, like there are around 1.6 billion residential air, conditioner, air conditioners in use and it's like definitely going to increase over the years. So how do we actually uh, manage this uh, how do we use this efficiently? And at the same time, how do we, uh, uh, how, how do we ensure consumer protection in this? So uh, when we uh, look at this, I think what is most importantly, what is most needed is efficient, uh, uh, the efficiency, the standards needs to be improved of these uh, uh, cooling uh, equipments. And we need to see, look at technological advances uh, to manage peak demand and simple solutions like cool roofs, as I had mentioned earlier, and also off-grid solutions. It's very, very important. Off-grid green solutions, um, uh, like rooftop solar and uh, 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 things like uh, uh, renewable, use of renewables, basically. And also uh, developing some uh, like finance and business models that would be actually um, uh, uh, make sure that there is equity. Uh, in um, uh, like people accessing these um, uh, uh, technologies and are able to use the uh, uh, cooling uh, options. Uh, uh, these are all very important. So um, yeah, basically this is what is needed to ensure that um, everyone is able to access the cooling technologies. At the same time, the best option 
is to actually ensure that we um, uh, uh, we go for uh, we try our best with natural cooling uh, simple uh, things like better ventilation for house houses and uh, green roof and all these will help so when Thank we you. talk about uh, 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 when we Roger? talk about heating Sorry. Roger, I'm just going to have to cut there because we only have 10 minutes left. This has oh. been a, a really deep conversation, but I will invite everybody. Um, I think it would be fantastic to have the opportunity for a longer conversation specifically on this and yeah. on sustainable finance. I do want to check. I know the ambassador um, may need to move on uh, uh, for obvious reasons. And I do want to come to that conversation about given all of this wealth of solutions, Given all of these ideas from consumer awareness to helping build and disrupt new business models uh, to the, the asks that are being made of policymakers. First, uh, Dr. Prasad, if I can come to you, which of these ideas do you feel have greatest potential return on investment? Where should we be focusing our efforts as consumer advocates? And second, how can we best work together with you? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Elena, and to uh, fellow panelists and your listeners. A very good afternoon to you from uh, Glasgow, from COP26. And uh, thank you for uh, bringing uh, the consumer perspective into the heart of, uh, of the COP process. And I, I'm uh, very happy to be uh, involved in this conversation because uh, I, I really think uh, that uh, uh, there's a tremendous scope uh, for uh, uh, mainstreaming uh, consumer uh, uh, interest in helping us achieve the 1.5 uh, or net zero target. Let me make uh, two quick points to lay out the argument. One, uh, in Fiji, since uh, we signed to the Paris uh, Agreement, uh, uh, Fiji has been hit by 13 cyclones and uh, three of them were amongst the worst in, in a century. Uh, if I transpose that uh, total impact of these 13, of which uh, three were super cyclones, uh, onto the UK economy of uh, about 1.7 trillion pounds, uh, UK economy would have uh, lost uh, something like 3.4 trillion pounds over a seven year period. It, uh, the level of crush on the UK economy would be the equivalent of that. So when uh, you talk about uh, climate change, this is the scale of impact uh, that uh, uh, Fiji, and the, I, I could be describing any Pacific country or many uh, small island uh, or highly vulnerable state I could be describing, that be more or less in that order. So that's the scale of uh, what we are talking about. Uh, if, if you took away every penny and pound from the UK economy twice over uh, within a seven year period, uh, and you expect it to rebuild. And uh, uh, second, uh, it is said uh, in Glasgow in, in COP, the Oceans Day. So let me pose another example uh, for, for all of you. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to your uh, inputs and ideas on this. The global tuna industry is an 8 billion uh, industry from uh, uh, most recent uh, records. Uh, something like uh, $2 billion uh, of the global tuna industry, uh, $2.5 billion of the global tuna industry uh, is uh, of IUU, illegal, underreported, uh, and uh, criminal uh, uh, fishing activities. Uh, in, in short, uh, a choice, uh, uh, one in every three cans of tuna sold in Sainsbury's and, uh, and Tesco's, etc is and it, I'm not saying that is true, uh, could potentially be a, a tuna can that is uh, illegal and underreported. Uh, so uh, that's 2.5 billion of, of uh, 8 billion uh, economy uh, from uh, across the globe, of which uh, uh, the Pacific's loss, the share of the loss to all of the Pacific, Blue Pacific, small island states in the Pacific is uh, e equal to about 650. Uh, million dollars. $650 million uh, taken stressed across 14 small island uh, independent states is almost twice as the to uh, twice the amount of total grant overseas development assistance they get. So from a single uh, act of uh, wise consumer choice of uh, selecting a traceable 
and uh, and uh, uh, accountable tuna can or of uh, Tesco's or of uh, 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 any other chain of uh, supermarket anywhere in the world. Uh, consumer collectively, consumers collectively uh, would be making more contribution than all grant ODA put together to, uh, to Fiji and, and to the Pacific. So that is the level of power that uh, consumers have. And, uh, and my final point would be as, uh, as Fiji is, is demonstrating, uh, we have uh, brought in uh, uh, the, our net zero commitment into domestic law. In short, uh, uh, net zero is now the law. Uh, Fiji should uh, no longer be called a trans, uh, an emerging market. It should be a emerging net zero market by law. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in addition to that, the, uh, the, the tools and instruments that uh, governments have in working with you and consumers uh, are using uh, uh, taxation wisely. In, in Fiji, we have introduced an environment and climate adapt adaptation levy it is essentially a levy on carbon, on your travel, on, on goods uh, that you buy, uh, and uh, the money, uh, the tax that is uh, received from those consumer items, including travel and all the sectors that you have spoken about, is then used for community relocation, for climate adaptation, for building seawalls, for uh, improving uh, agriculture so they can uh, withstand more frequent rains, etc. So that's uh, uh, at a national uh, law. Uh, then uh, more at the fiscal level, you have uh, instruments uh, uh, like that. Uh, if the two parts of the three parts at the global level and at the national level governments and then consumers can work much better together, uh, then uh, we can ensure that uh, uh, both the choices that consumers want to make and are capable of making are supported through fiscal and other policies, one. And two, uh, that where governments are not going far enough uh, that consumers can help them move uh, much further, such as in, uh, in uh, Fiji has also banned plastics and styrofoam, uh, and uh, that consumers can actually drive governments to take uh, these type of actions as well. Uh, plastic is essentially a, a byproduct of carbon. Uh, if you eliminated uh, uh, plastic, it reduces the demand for carbon globally. It's a small choice an individual consumers making globally. It's a mega choice. It is my uh, personal hope uh, and hope of uh, uh, Fiji's Prime Minister, who's the chair of the Pacific Islands, uh, states that all of Pacific will be a plastic-free zone uh, within a two-year time. Uh, and that uh, if consumers were driving governments to take that type of action, we move much, uh, much faster. Uh, but uh, 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 let me sum by saying, you know, uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and I'm, I'm pre uh, presenting this back to you. I really like uh, the perspective you are bringing into COP that we should bring a consumer perspective right into the heart and the mainstream of, of COP. And there's nothing better if consumers are through their shareholding choices, uh, telling businesses and services and banks, etc. If you're not a net zero company, I'm moving my business elsewhere. If consumers, and uh, what they're uh, eating over lunch or, or breakfast, uh, in, as it would very soon be in PG, uh, consuming things that have uh, that are committed to net zero, that are circular, that are locally sourced uh, more, uh, more likely, and that have a far far lesser uh, carbon uh, footprint. Or if you are flying and traveling a, a airline such as uh, Fiji Airways, when you sit on a Fiji Airways flight from first of uh, December when Fiji reopens, uh, and we welcome you back, and as you strap your uh, your seat belts, and you get that uh, uh, the video of uh, of uh, emergency services at the start. It will tell you that uh, for every mile you have traveled, uh, you'll be uh, uh, that carbon mangroves and trees will be planted in Fiji in, in proportion to the uh, to uh, to your carbon footprint. That in all these type of choices we are making, we are driving uh, governments. We are helping uh, put uh, pressure and accountability on governments. We are putting pressure and accountability on companies. And uh, finally, we are making very informed choices about, about uh, what the choices we make uh, in the marketplace. And uh, we are, I'm talking to you from Glasgow. Uh, this cannot work through the invisible hand of Adam Smith. It, it needs to be a very visible hand. And I think uh, uh, Consumers International and Consumer 
uh, activists across the world have a very, uh, very important and very strong role to play in this. And, uh, thank you very much. I, I really look forward to uh, continuing conversation with you and, and Fiji is uh, very supportive of this initiative uh, to bring uh, consumer perspectives into the heart of the COP discussion. Thank Good you morning. so much. Thank you so much for joining us and um, for giving that powerful perspective on the importance of consumers and of consumer advocacy. Seema Shandil is the CEO of the Consumer Council of Fiji, so she's the one uh, shouting for consumers on the ground. Seema, can you just give us one minute? What has made this successful? What can we learn from your efforts to bring the consumer voice and build together with your government? Just one minute, if I can ask. Okay, thank you, Helena. Um, Bulabinaka once again uh, to you all from Fiji. Um, is His Excellency Dr. Uh, you know Prasad has already highlighted our government's uh, active involvement, not only you know um, active involvement to make sure that uh, they achieve the commitment of net zero um, you know by 2050. So there, a lot of work has been done in that area, and consumer. We are lucky to say that you know in Fiji. Uh, the government of Fiji is very closely working with uh, the consumer bodies, not only with Consumer Council of Fiji, but these other bodies, so that you know we can work together to make sure that we can quickly eradicate the carbon footprint. You know, though we are not the huge contributors, but you know we are the ones that are largely impacted. So, uh, what we try to do here is to advocate very aggressively because we want consumers to change their behavior, uh, so that in future this sustainable choice should become the default choice of consumers and the unsustainable choice should become the impossible choice so that's what we are trying to do but you know sometimes what happens is that you know uh, uh, it becomes quite difficult to um, change the consumption behavior because or push consumers towards green consumerism because of the um, you know affordability issues uh, sometimes you know uh, as the mentality is and even uh, consumers they believe that um, um, you know, uh, green uh, or sustainable products may be expensive compared to conventional products. Most, most mindsets is that going green is always um, the most expensive uh, option. So for this reason, you know, the council is advocating very aggressively uh, or that consumers need to change their um, uh, uh, consumption patterns and why they should change. Because I think in order to change the mindset of people, uh, you know, we need to tell them the reasons as to why they have to bring about ch uh, changes. And Fiji being a very small small um, island state, we also don't have much, uh, you know, um, say in, in, in the products that we import, we are not like a dictator because our market is very small. Uh, you know, we are sort of takers. So sometimes we get products that are not environmental, um, you know, friendly. But uh, as I said, we work very closely with all the government ministries. So uh, we make submissions where we see that that particular product is not just, um, environmental friendly, friendly and there needs to be a standard placed. Uh, and uh, just recently, a submission by Consumer Council of Fiji on electrical products was made to the line ministry, whereby, you know, now the government uh, um, team and the Consumer Council being the main stakeholders, we are developing standards. So we will definitely see, uh, you know, changes in uh, efficient and environmental, uh, environment friendly products being imported in Fiji. So these are some of the works that we are doing with. Uh, the government of Fiji and um, I thank you we've reached the top of the hour so um, I hope everybody takes that as an invitation to continue the conversation um, we've heard from Seema how real action real you know um, passion can make even a the smallest of countries or the smallest of us as an individual consumers can make real change um, I hope we can continue to work together as a global movement um, I hope we can focus on these six areas of crucial change, uh, that we can make sustainability easy for consumers, that the, we can make the transition fast, fair, and accountable. Um, and the ambassador referred to Adam Smith. He was at 14 years old. He was here at Glasgow University studying um, and before writing the, the Wealth of Nations. And let's make a tipping point in this market. Let's make it a marketplace shift and a move to a different type of economics um, where the marketplace is safe 
fair and sustainable for all of us. It will only happen with your passion, your dedication, um, and your, your uh, wonderful engagement. So thank you everyone for joining here today. Um, and we look forward to being in touch. Stay safe, stay well, and goodbye from Glasgow.